Thank you very much, Clifford. Uh, kia ora, tēnā katoa katoa. Uh, first, a word from my sponsor. Um, the Film Archive, I'll just mention the Film Archive briefly because it's a slightly unusual organisation. It's a charitable trust set up over 30 years ago to fill a sort of a gap in the market, if you like, of uh, housing and restoring New Zealand's film heritage. And we've since expanded our scope to look after current film productions, television programming, advertising, home movies, and, uh, well, pretty much all forms of moving image. Um, we don't own the collection. Uh, it's all owned by depositors. Um, they still retain ownership and copyright, so we can't actually leverage the collection to help pay for its restoration. We uh, need to fundraise all the time. Um, we have a really good cafe with excellent coffee. Um, and we have a media library that you can go and sit in and watch New Zealand films, but you can't borrow, borrow them at the time. Um, anyway, that's enough of the advertising. Our, um, our operations are divided into three main areas, pretty familiar to all archivists. All right. So the, um, the main focus of my talk is digital storage. Uh, if everything is digital in the near future, then there's a couple of questions we really need to answer now. Now. There we go. Um, how will we store our films? Um, we've been making digital video since 1997 on the um, brilliant DV format, um, and we're still liking that a lot. We, and we use it for um, to record. T we started off using it to record TV programming for New Zealand on air, and we've been using it as a mezzanine format up until about a year or so ago. Um, it's fairly robust for a very small tape, better than DAT. Um, and we've been storing digital films since 1999 when we received our first digital feature, New Zealand's first digital feature, Uncomfortable Comfortable, um, also deposited on DV tape. Um, we're not quite at the stage of receiving uh, films by email, uh, but we do receive lots on, on digital files on tape and on hard drives of various configurations and with... Um, various issues uh, around even accessing them. The Film Archive is a totally uh, Macintosh-based environment, so we have um, some issues around that. Um, the boss doesn't like to see anything but an apple in the building, so that's uh, an ongoing battle for us. Um, the great bulk of our collection is still film and video. Um, the processes to preserve them now, though, are almost all digital. Um, for small gauge film, 8mm, Super 8, 9.5mm, we now have a, um, a scanner in-house. so. This is supplied by Dam Smart, um, our uh, conference sponsors up there. That's, uh, they do a really good job. Um, we can, so we can scan all those films uh, individually, frame by frame. There's a, a laser in this that means that we don't have to worry about film that is uh, severely, severely shrunk or damaged. It um, doesn't rely on sprockets. Um, and we... Uh, Basically, we scan them at a roughly a 1K resolution, store them as individual DPX files, and then pump them out uh, to QuickTime or JPEG 2000 movies. These files live briefly on a Mac Pro that captures them. Then we have to shunt them to another Mac Pro because there's not enough room to keep capturing and processing them. Then we process them, and then we pump them out to um, LTO tapes. Um, with feature films, we outsource the final preservation work to Park Road Post and create new film elements. Uh, new negatives, interpositive sound negatives, these are close to the I archival ideal of retaining the original con object, and we're confident in the uh, longevity of polyester-based film elements. Um, in the past, of course, nitrate film and uh, acetate film have uh, major issues, which are what we're grappling with today. Hopefully polyester won't develop any new diseases in the meantime. Um, we're hopeful that stored correctly should be, you know, 300 years to 400 years. Again, it's a, it's a bit like the CD manufacturers. That's the manufacturer's uh, concept of how long they'll, they'll last. I won't be around to worry about it. Um, well, I do worry about it, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Uh, even with this uh, seemingly traditional film preservation path for features, um, Almost everything has changed. Um, much, much of the preservation work involves scanning the original film and then doing restoration work on digital files and then outputting it back to film. So there's no escaping the digital world. Um, so talking about we'll need a bigger hard drive, that's just one of those moments because Jaws was one of those movies when I was a kid that made me want, not want to go swimming. There's also that moment where you have the sudden adrenaline rush when you realise that you actually don't have the right equipment to do the job, and oops, try not to panic. 
Um, Park Road Post rang to say they had a scan of, uh, well, I can't mention the feature. Um, they needed to clear it off their uh, servers and the, and the owner of the film said that we could have it. Um, the problem was they, they asked, could we stitch it back together at our place? Um, because it was uh, over seven terabytes and they couldn't fit it all on a, on a single hard drive. Um, the largest hard drive at the moment apparently is about four terabytes. Um, I just love some of the old, there's a few old pictures just for entertainment's sake, but um, 30 years ago one gigabyte was state of the art. Um, typically our files are returned to us from Park Road Post and Weather Digital's DPX 10-bit uncompressed QuickTime and JPEG. Um, so um, with videotape we transfer them in-house as well, again to 10-bit um, uncompressed files. Uh, at the moment we're using QuickTime. Uh, they're not on a wrapper, we're going to have to move them on to something else eventually. Um, but we very quickly have to move them on to LTO tape. Um, so uh, the use of LTO tape occurred somewhat organically. It followed a traditional model of buying a tape deck and cartons of tapes to store some digital files, uh, very much like our previous model of copying master videotape. So that's how that worked. And as you can see, we've already managed to get up to 1.2 petabytes almost without really trying. Um, this is uh, of some concern because um, uh, we're certainly not um, quality checking them uh, very effectively as we go. Um, is this the way we sh should continue? Uh, well, I think we've heard a few things. Uh, certainly uh, Chris from the Internet Archive asked, answered my question yesterday about how much her, uh, I was rather envious of her petabyte of storage all in one rack. Um, and today the, um, from the Church of the Latter-day Saints also had a, uh, a cost factor about that which showed that um, I think um, data tapes are just so much cheaper than servers. Uh, the problem being of course the access uh, accessibility, the checking and the migration, you need to have those tapes in some sort of system. Um, it is a worry, data tape is essentially the same type of tape that we've been using for videotape. In fact it is the same, it just is recording ones and zeros instead of Im images. Um, and we're really not too sure how that long, how long that will last. Um, might be skipping ahead here. Um, so with hard drives and things, I mean, they're not a realistic uh, long-term storage medium for us. They will, of course, be part of the solution in terms of access and things. They do have quite a high failure rate, a bit higher than the manufacturers advertise, um, probably because it's a failure rate in the real world rather than in a clean room. Um, there's also solid state devices um, that are way more expensive and not very large at the moment, but you never know, something else might happen. Um, before you even start um, putting stuff into digital files, though, you need to be confident about what you're, what you're putting in. Um, so you have to check that it is what it says it is and it's the quality it promises. Um, once upon a time, I mean, this is this is the archivist thing: is that fear of the black box. Is once upon a time, if you found a piece of film, you could hold it up to the light and take a reasonable guess at what it was. Um, this is the classic publicity photo for film archivists. Um, no such luck with videotape, and um, a lot of uh, film archivists really didn't even want to deal with videotape, um, let alone get into digital files. Um, when you stumble across a hard drive or data tape in, in the rubble in the future, or in a suitcase under the bed. Um, you'll need not only a machine, but the operating system to match and probably a key to unlock it. Ideally, a transfer to a new format would take place as soon as possible and the whole thing would be quality checked. Um, at the moment, quality checking uh, means watching the whole thing, listening to it and uh, not missing any bits in case there are any bits missing. This almost never happens at the archive. Um, those files returned to us by Park Road Post and Weta Digital are viewed in their entirety at the superb facilities at Park Road. And there's usually a queue of um, film archivists for the car to go out and have really great coffee and sit in the big squishy couches um, out at Park Road Post. Um, that's possible and desirable because there's only a few of these titles being preserved at a time and they're costing a lot of money to do so. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, we're receiving more than 10,000 titles every year and our acquisition staff, if they did nothing else all day, they couldn't possibly watch them. Um, so we just have to take a guess. Um, as our analogue material has been digitised, it's been scrutinised for technical issues, 
and we're essentially doing, checking the head and tail of, uh, of items as they go, and maybe a quick look at the file once it's uh, recorded. So if there's a major stuff up, then, um, then usually we catch it, but you know, I'm sure that somewhere down the road we are, there's dirty data already in our system. Um, back to the question of handling incoming material. When I started at the archive, we had a brand new professional super VHS machine. That was the, that was the best thing we had. An old Betamax and a Umatic player that made, the, made a Massey Ferguson tractor look like a Porsche. Um, we now have the ability to handle about half of the, the titles on this slide, um, half of the formats there. Um, but essentially it's the same thing with digital files. Um, in this case, we won't just need a lot of machines, but a lot of applications, licenses, codecs, etc. Um, especially if we want to retain the uh, original in its original format as per our archival uh, promise, if you like. Um, there's never been an international standardised format for archiving film and television. They're still arguing about it. Um, you know, there's a lot of manufacturers investing a lot of money in creating new uh, interesting formats. There is one for audio archiving. Uh, I don't know quite how official it is, but um, basically the way it, WAV format and uh, is pretty much used internationally now for audio. Uh, so, uh, Michael, a bit easier on that, that part for you. Um, a recent survey in the US showed um, non-profit archives using 12 different tape and file formats to preserve the moving image. So that's not even dealing with what's coming in, that's what they're creating as well. So, something else for the future. There's also an extra complication for hard drives and files are lockable. Um, when we collected physical films, it sometimes looks like this. Um, this is a collection, we were alerted to this by a conscientious contractor. Um, as he was demolishing this house, he found some film. Um, this contained uh, masters for a New Zealand feature, plus numerous other very interesting bits and pieces. Now imagine that room as a steel vault with a combination padlock on the outside. Uh, obviously we could ask for the key from the depositor, but surprisingly frequently orphan films uh, do turn up, and I would anticipate being handed hard drives um, in the future by relatives and strangers alike who had no idea what was on it or what the password was. In addition, there's also the digital cinema package. Uh, DCP is used for approximately two-thirds of all screenings in the US now, and probably more here in New Zealand. Uh, it comes, arrives at cinemas as an encrypted package, and the key is an XML file that can be read by the destination cinema. It also includes dates for the run that the film is, uh, is going to be running for, so it's a bit like Mission Impossible. You know, the, I don't know that it actually dissolves in a cloud of steam, but um, you probably won't have very much luck, even if you do have the key afterwards, at actually accessing that. So this pretty much precludes the kind of film rescue that we did in the past. Um, we would find lost features and uh, resurrect them. A big plus for DCP, though, is that it has helped to solidify um, a, a digital format, and JPEG 2000, which we've heard a bit about in the last two days, is what DCP uses. It's pretty much the only one they use, uh, and it's immensely scalable. It has a whole bunch of advantages, as well as a couple of disadvantages, um, but that's a whole other talk, really. Uh, somebody more technically minded could address that one day. Um, Meanwhile, we're hoping that the studios will look after the masters of those films so we won't have to rescue them uh, from the rubble. Uh, hopefully they'll do a better job than they did back at the transition for, from, uh, from silent to sound. Um, uh, at that point, they lost over 80% of their product. Um, part of the good news story, I guess, about digital is that it gives us a chance. It's something to do with, the, uh, with holding on to the originals. So this is... Uh, from our collection, um, and with digital technology, we now have the opportunity to go back and scan directly off the, old, the original uh, nitrate. So this film was actually preserved in the 80s chemically, a new interneg, and then a new print made. That's a couple of generations right there. We've managed to keep it in a pretty much stable condition, and hopefully now, with um, the help of Weta Digital, we're going to take those films and have another go at scanning them directly to create a digital master from the original. So, uh, in Germany, um, I believe the German archive is uh, busy burning their nitrate film because they don't want to store it anymore. Um, well, that's if you believe everything you read on the internet. Um, so we do want to hold on to it. Um, and also, the other thing about holding on to it is things that we don't know that we had. Um, 
we had a we had a film called Upstream in our foreign night track collection because we're a member of the International Federation of Film Archives. We maintained looking after it. We thought it was some sort of fishing film or something. You know, we never looked at it because we're not funded. We're not funded to um, look at it, to do anything more with um, foreign films. Fortunately, the NFPF from America sent um, an archivist out to have a look for us, and we found um, John Ford's first feature. Uh, in addition to that, um, also hit, uh, Alfred Hitchcock's first uh, directorial debut, or at least three out of about five reels of it. We're still looking for the other two. We haven't found them. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of pitfalls in acquiring material and holding on to it. But once we do have them, you know, as digital files, how long will they last? Um, if our culture is ones and zeros, we need, you know, that requires machinery to access it. How long can we sustain that? Um, we've been storing data on, a, uh, you know, for 50 years. I mean, that's that's great, isn't it? I just love that. Um, and we've only had electricity for 150 years. And yet, how long are we going to try and maintain this co this moving image culture? You know, we're, we're aiming for more than 150 years at least. Um, that means we require a sustained power and mechanical maintenance, but also m means a sustained environment and a sustained culture of care. Um, and that's one of the major risks, I think. So um, that's a flood map of Wellington, by the way. That was in the Dominion Post on the weekend. I think it pretty much covers Archives New Zealand, National Library, uh, the Film Archive, you know. That's only 100 years out, according to one prediction, so we'd better get all painting all the roads white to uh, reflect sunlight back. Um, so some of these risks are just forces of nature, and we just have to do our best to mitigate that. But some of them are actual ongoing um, technical risks that are complicated by low budgets and misunderstanding of the demands of the digital age, and others are a constant factor in our archival practice. Those are some of the technical risks. Um, I don't know if we need to, I think we're all familiar if we're dealing in the digital environment. I mean, we can read that, and uh, there's a number of issues there. Um, a few years ago at a film co conference, um, the question was posed, the building's on fire, what do you grab to save your film if you just take one thing? There were people saying, oh, we'll grab the negative, we'll do this. The answer was a film print because it has the picture and the, the sound on it. And of course, these days, you'd think the answer is now grab the hard drive off your desk, you're probably going to save several films at once. The real answer is leave everything and get out of the building because it's on fire. Um, <laughs> and also because you've backed it up somewhere else, so it doesn't matter. That is the answer. Um, and it's this sort of a reduction in storage size and the ease with which um, it can be transferred that ensures the survival of digital film. It's the distributed archive where many copies in many places. There's challenges to that. You've got uh, HD and 3D and uh, uh, recorded much higher shooting rate by ca digital cameramen. You know, oh, it doesn't matter, we'll just churn up the tapes. That's fine, except when it comes to documentaries. The film archive, as our policy, keeps all wild tapes and footage for documentaries. Um, for obvious reason, it has great interviews, but we're just getting enormous quantities coming in. Um, all wonderful stuff, I'm sure. But uh, it does create more stress on the system, and it, you seem to wonder whether the, uh, the filmmaking community is just going to expand to take up whatever capacity we can create. Um, there's also uh, a whole bunch of stuff about acquisitions, accessioning stuff, um, automated systems that collect metadata, face recognition software and cataloging uh, programs, data-seeking programs on the internet that might be able to catalog some of this stuff um, without too much human inter intervention. Uh, that's the dream of uh, a number of my staff. This has been used before, and I did have a big laugh at I think it's a, uh, 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 obviously says something to us about our vision of future archives. They're a bit grandiose and look a bit like um, what they used to look like, and they're kind of like books, except they're glowing, so they're obviously modern, so that's pretty good. Um, having so much material on hand does risk being, getting swamped, so um, you do wonder whether historians will be, con whether archivists will continue to mediate the stories or whether it will just become truly non hierarchical and people will do their own. Uh, searching out and, and hunting down on the internet. Um, so that is the real future an invisible archive? And that was kind of uh, hinted at uh, this morning at the session we're in, one where you know, just we retreat into the background. Um, for the film archive as a charitable trust, um, which relies on funding, becoming invisible would be the death of us, because we need to be out there to keep 
showing people that we're doing the job. So somewhere we can't actually afford to become invisible. Um, so there's a whole bunch of um, strategies, uh, and I've assumed in most of them that um, migration is the key. And but we've also heard about emulation. I'm not sure, too sure about emulation. You know, it sort of seems like a rather high risk strategy. Uh, sorry, Ian. <laughs> But, uh, you know, the idea that we'll just keep something and then in 50, 60 years we'll be able to access it using some clever software. Um, I can't afford to pay clever enough people at the archive to, to do that at the moment. But, uh, um, there are other, at least, let's see, and this is the, the other great vision of the archive, you know, the, kind of the opposite image, which is, you know, you're just going to store it away and forget about it um, and maybe never get it back. Um, so we do need to uh, we do need to keep it visible. We can't just do that with it. Um, if anybody you know, if nobody looks at them in a hundred years, is it does it really you know is it worth even keeping them? So you really do need to keep it out there. Um, and I might have just enough time for my uh, favourite just sort of little rundown at the end, which is um, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, and this is actually crib from a talk I gave uh, a little while back, which is. You know, digital technology is all sparkly and new, but is there anything we can learn from the past? So, which culture retained its records for the longest time? The Romans, Greeks, Egyptians? You know, we know their stories, two and a half thousand years, three thousand years, five thousand years. What are we aiming for? Well, um, you know, this lasted in the nice dry desert pretty well. Interestingly, I think the greatest success story um, also comes from the desert and maybe the Aboriginal cultures of Australia. For 40,000 years, the indigenous people of the biggest island uh, kept their culture alive through a highly structured oral tradition. Uh, verbal record, maybe not as accurate as a document, and it cannot guarantee word for word accuracy, but that was less important than maintaining the consistency of the content. Indeed, long term flexibility with words changing to reflect changes in language and customs may enable the basic story to retain relevance to the people it was designed to serve rather than becoming seen as quaint, old, or irrelevant. So how did the Aboriginal people, in what has been a vast and harsh environment, keep these stories alive and essentially unchanging? These stories were important to their survival, as well as having an economic and cultural value, and an elaborate system was devised that included multiple redundancies and disaster planning. The stories were linked to parts of the land and to the animals that lived there. These acted as mnemonics anchoring the tale. Landmarks were essentially unchanging, but could also be accompanied by carved trees and rock art. Each story, dance or ceremony was entrusted to a set of custodians, with each custodian maintaining responsibility for a specific part of the story. The custodians were also the educators and were charged with teaching the next generation their particular part of the story. The custodians would be aware of the whole story, but could only teach the part of it that they were responsible for. In this way, when the younger generation recited their new knowledge, it had to all fit together, and the custodians would realise if any part of the story was changing. So that's a, an ancient form of error correction. Other family groupings would be responsible for certain stories or cer ceremonies, and these would be spread to other family groupings in the neighbouring areas. So there's you know, geographic mitigation there. In this way, if a set of custodians died or one tribe was wiped out, then a backup copy could be obtained from a related tribe. Of course, unfortunately, this uh, system, which seems to have sustained Abor Aboriginal culture for thousands of decades, uh, collapsed almost completely under the onslaught of European visitation. Um, disease spread from the very first contact, and it was so devastating that by the time the first settlers arrived in New South Wales, um, only a couple of decades later, they described the native people as primitive and without sophistication. What they were seeing was people suffering from starvation had suffered a population collapse of 60% or more in some areas. So a system that had sufficed for 500 centuries was all but destroyed in the space of just 20 years. They couldn't anticipate it, what was essentially an alien invasion just around the corner. Um, and so that's, uh, I guess, a cautionary tale. We don't know what we don't know. Thank you, Donald Rumsfeld. Um, and um, that's pretty much the conclusions, uh, despite that maybe slightly pessimistic thing. Is, I, mean, I think if we do 40,000 years, we'll be doing pretty well. Um, keeping goodbye pork pie uh, for those foreigners. That's a classic New Zealand uh, comedy, if you like. Um, but it's, um, you know, I think the digital age actually promises everything. I don't think it was sustainable to keep our old archives the way, we, way they were. 
and I think the digital age offers a hell of a lot. So that's, uh, the con we just have to be a little bit cautionary about what we do and what we invest in. So that was the, um, that's it, the digital future is bright. Okay, thank you very much.